Hello and welcome to my talk for the TEAP conference 2020, which unfortunately had to be cancelled. My name is Julian Keil. I'm a professor for biological psychology at the University of Kiel. And uh, today I will present you some of my recent work on the emotional and cognitive influences on multisensory integration. In our everyday life, we have to ask ourselves where do information come from? We receive information that uh, arrive through our eyes, through our ears, so auditory, visual, tactile information, and all these bits and pieces of information have to be integrated to one coherent percept. We know this from Gestalt perception, for Gestalt psychology, where we group single elements into one coherent percept, which we know from, for example, the Canissa figure, where we group circles into one coherent figure. The same happens in multisensory perception, where, for example, we have to ask ourselves, where do auditory and visual information come from? So in a crowd, we have to ask, where is auditory and visual information coming from? Are these different speakers or are these speakers the same person? So the basic question um, here is, which elements belong together? Which elements can we group to um, coherent Objects. So this is a question of causal inf uh, inference, so which um, source causes our perception. In my research, I ask, uh, is this causal inference, is this inference of a source, is this integration of different elements, of different perceptual elements into one coherent percept, is this stable always? Do we always perceive the same thing? So is our perception over time stable? The next question I ask is, if it is not stable, so if our perception is not stable, which processes influence our perception? So, for example, attention, cognition, emotion, are these, all these processes an influence on our perception? And then, finally, we can ask, what are the neural correlates of these um, perceptual processes of this multisensory integration? I summarized all these topics together with Daniel Zinkowski um, two years ago in our review paper on the neural mechanisms of multisensory integration. Right now, I look at this question using the so-called sound-induced flash illusion. The sound-induced flash illusion is a not-so-new perceptual effect. Actually, actually it's um, now been published 20 years ago and there's been very nice review papers on this. Um, and the sound-induced flash illusion consists of the perception of two visual stimuli when, when we are presented with two auditory and one visual stimulus. So here we can see the basic setup. I present two auditory stimuli together with one visual stimulus, which induces the perception of two, uh, which sometimes induces the perception of two visual stimuli. And this year, um, there's been there's a very extensive review paper by Hirst et al., who looked at all the papers who published anything about this, um, this sound-induced flash illusion, and they showed that the sound-induced flash illusion occurs as long as auditory and visual stimuli occur within a time frame of plus minus 70 milliseconds. And this is a very stable um, multisensory effect, which does not occur in every trial. So it's a we have over, over studies, over um, different experiments, we see that the average illusion rate is about 50%. So we have a bi-stable audiovisual perception. In my research now, I ask, why is this perception bi-stable? So it's always the same stimulus. It's always two auditory and one, visu um, one visual stimulus combined. And the question here is, why is the perception not always the same? So why is, does the perception fluctuate between one and two visual stimuli? And um, my colleagues and I, we did a series of experiments where we looked at influences on this perception. The first experiment, which was done by my PhD student, Jorgos Michael, um, he looked at the influence of cognitive load. So um, if I combine the sound-induced flash illusion with a very, very um, taxing second task, the so-called so NBAC task, which is cognitively very demanding. 
um, if you do if you take part in this experiment, it's, it's it's really really hard. It's really annoying. And so what happens if we combine this really hard task with the sound induced flash illusion? And what we see here is that the um, the second task actually increases the likelihood of the illusion perception. So the sci-fi illusion rate actually increases. So here no back is the standard, the basic um, sound induced flash illusion task, just the sound induced flash illusion. We see an average illusion rate of about 50% and this illusion rate rises too close to 60% if we increase the cognitive load. So this is, an, this is a very important first demonstration in which we show that our perception, yes, we know that our perception fluctuates between trials, so it's in the, so this bistable perception with a percept with an illusion rate of around fifty percent, and the cognitive load is in, in is increased cognitive load induced by the n vectors actually increases the illusion rate. So now the second question we had was: um, Is this actually cognitive load or is it perceptual load? So was it just increasing? something that that's happening um, on the screen does it does just increasing stuff that's happening on the screen also increase the illusion rate and this was a diploma thesis by uh, Anna Klingmüller who she just finished um, her diploma um, at Kiel and here we combine the sound induced flash illusion together with multiple stimuli prior to stimulus onset so we did this in two different fashions we had either a fixed interval or a variable interval and in, this, in these intervals prior to the onset of the sound induced flash illusion we presented just flashes which just very simple stimuli that should induce a perceptual load and also act as cues when the stimulus will actually occur so these, these additional um, cues they told our participants when the sound induced flash illusion stimulus would occur Interestingly, here we also find an increase in the illusion rate, but only in the condition where this interval is variable. So only when the, um, when the temporal expectation on the off, about the onset of the sun induced flash illusion is not very strong. And we see here that the perceptual load actually increases the illusion rate. So just adding more visual stimuli to our experiment increases um, the illusion rate, whereas the temporal expectations themselves, so using a fixed interval, doesn't really change anything about our perception. So the sound induced flash illusion likely is influenced by crowding or by perceptual load, but not by expectations. So again, we followed up this experiment with a question, okay, what happens if we not just use simple stimuli, like simple like, like flashes, but more complex stimuli, like pictures, like that have actually semantic content. And again, this was a diploma thesis, in this case by um, Linda Koenen, who also just finished her diploma in Kiel. In this uh, experiment, we combined the sound-induced flash illusion with emotional visual, visual stimuli. So we took pictures from the IAPS database and presented these pictures from the IAPS database in this interval, in this variable interval prior to the onset of the sound induced flash illusion. Interestingly here we find a reduction of the sound induced flash illusion rate. So com compared to the no stim condition which is just the basic sound induced flash illusion we actually see a decrease in the illusion rate. And this decrease is not modulated by emotional balance, so it doesn't really matter whether it's a positive or negative or a neutral picture. As long as the picture there, the, in the, the illusion rate is decreased. So now we're a bit puzzled about that actually, because in the other experiments we saw adding visual stimuli actually increased the, um, the sound induced flash illusion. So we were a bit puzzled what is going on here with this more complex um, visual stimuli. So we did another experiment um, in which we didn't use visual stimuli but we used auditory stimuli. So basically the same setup um, again we presented emotional stimuli prior to the um, sound induced flash illusion onset. In this case 
um, sounds from the International Affective, Affective Sound Database. Um, and again, here we see the same reduction of the illusion rate. So again, we see no modulation by the emotional content, so the valence of the stimuli doesn't really play, play a role here, but the presence of an, emo of, of an auditory stimuli actually reduces the illusion rate. So we were inter interpreting these results in terms of arousal. So these are very complex stimuli, and even though the emotional valence itself doesn't really play a role, they are very like they are very complex. They have semantic content. We have to think about these, and this might increase arousal, and this increased arousal could lead to a reduced illusion rate. Finally, in our uh, last project, we are now looking at the neural correlates of this change in multisensory perception due to added stimuli. So we went back to the NBAC task, and again, this is a project by Jorgos Michael, who looked at now the EEG correlates of this perception. For us, the reassuring thing here is that we replicate our own effect. So we do the same experiment twice in different populations, in different labs, um, and we see the same effect. So again, adding this NBAC task to our sound-induced flash illusion increased the illusion rate. We find the same effect. Um, there's no effect on the um, response times, but we find this increase in illusion rates. And now we looked here into the neural correlates of this change in perception. And when we look at um, the neural activity prior to stimulus onset, we find the usual activity we find with induced, uh, with induced memory load, with induced cognitive load, so an increase in frontal theta band power. On the other hand, if we look at neural activity after stimulus onset, we again find a modulation of prefrontal or frontal neural oscillations, of, uh, an early modulation of theta band power and a late modulation of beta band power. And interestingly, this is, an, this is an interaction between perception and memory load, and we find the strongest modulation in this high memory load condition in the two-back task. So if we look at the frontal uh, theta and beta band power, we, we see that this power is modulated in the more cognitive demanding um, two-bag condition. So again, we replicate our um, effect of uh, cognitive load on increase in the sound-induced flash illusion, and we find that theta and beta band power reflect this interaction between cognitive load and change in perception. So to summarize this series of experiments, we first see that our perception is not stable. Multisensor integration fluctuates from trial to trial, and on average, we see a 50% illusion rate. We also see that emotional and cognitive processes actually influence multisensory perception. Cognitive load increases the perception. Perceptual load increases the perception. And on the other hand, arousal induced by visual and auditory stimuli likely reduces um, our illusion likelihood. So our multisensory integration is a very flexible, very highly dy dynamic process that is dependent on our perceptual and cognitive resources we have available to actually combine these different stimuli. So multisensory integration isn't necessarily an automatic process. There, is, there are automatic parts of multisensory integration, but complex perception is dependent on our cognitive resources. And these changes in cognitive resources are reflected in frontal, theta, and beta band power. And these different time frames, this early and late effect, are likely related to different stages of multisensory perception, a first sensory um, a process and a second later cognitive process, a cognitive integration process. So um, the next step would be to look at not only post-stimulus activity but also um, functional network connectivity and look at all these different aspects of so attention, expectations, emotions and cognitive load in combined 
EEG and behavioral studies. And we also have to look at the context. So where do we, uh, where do we measure our activity, uh, measure our multisensory perception? Here Merle Schuckert has a very nice poster and we can also move our laboratory experiments to real world settings and use, for example, more ecologically valid experiments. For example, Christian Neumann does this in a table tennis setting where we again modulate um, expectations and, and cognitive load in a real world task. So that is it for this series of experiments. I thank you for, uh, for your attention. And of course, I have to thank all my collaborators at the Charité Berlin, the uh, group of Daniel Zinkowski. Here, especially Jorgos Michael, who did the first study on the cognitive load and the EEG study on the cognitive load. Uh, also, um, Mathis Kaiser, who did very much basic work on the sound-induced flash illusion and the role of, pre of pre-stimulus activity on the um, sound-induced flash illusion. At the Christian Albrechts University Kiel, I have to thank uh, Christian Kernbach, um, whose labs I can use to do all my experiments. And here, um, my uh, diploma students, Linda Koenen, Corinna Kerl, Anna Klingmüller, and especially Merle Schuckert, who um, programmed a lot of these experiments and did a lot of background work on these experiments. So thank you for your attention. Here are some references for further reading. And I'm happy to answer all questions or any questions you might have. Um, in this case, we can't do a live uh, question answer session, but I'm happy to answer all questions via email or here in the comments below. Thank you.